Okay, I'm going to talk about bottleneck analysis, and I'm talking about a very important aspect of bottleneck analysis, which is the delivery of beer to large numbers of conference attendees. Some of you were, were there, I think. And it's very important to keep them in this happy state that you can see, um, as opposed to this fairly grumpy state that we had also at the night. And uh, what you tend to run into is this problem where you'll see a bottle and it's empty. Okay, so, so you have to figure out how are you going to manage and maintain four bottlenecks so that people can stay happy all the time? So let's assume that we're, we've deployed a Netflix-based cloud service, because we would do that kind of thing, to collect lots of data on, um, on how much beer people have consumed and uh, how long it took them to get it. So we have this beer service that's uh, monitoring things, and, it's you know, and we just have it at a URL, so we can do, I put some R code in here so people can figure out how to read files from R. And, um, and we plot the response time of how long it takes to get your beer. And uh, you know it's sort of OK, but it looks like there's these big spikes. Every now and again, we run out of beer um, or, they, or something. Um, and the unit of time here is the, jif the jiffy, because you get a beer in a jiffy. That's a, it's a unit of, you know, if one jiffy is a good amount of time to get your beer. If it takes too many jiffies, it's too long. Obviously, you know, spending 60 jiffies is a very long time. So how would we summarize this uh, response time? It's, this is the hard part, right? So let's try summarizing it with a few different ways of um, doing statistical things. And this, you know, it's maybe sort of, well, the mean is 3, so that's sort of OK. But the max is 67. And then we have quantiles and response standard deviations and means and two standard. It's, this is all hard stuff. So what we really want to do is make it easy to deliver large amounts of beer very quickly. And I have a, um, a great example here from QCon London. Who was at QCon London? So this was, this was the best beer delivery system I had ever seen. Basically, there was a room with maybe you know, something like 500 or 1,000 people in it, and there were these waiters with trays of Grolsch just making forays. They were just appearing and dashing in, and, and, and when their tray was empty, they went back for more. And it filled this room with beer extremely efficiently. And so that's, that's made easy. So, um, so let's, let's sort of do some modeling around what that actually looks like. Um, there's a, 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 some code I wrote in R once called CHP, which draws interesting graphs. Um, and I, I tried fitting it on a slide, and it didn't fit. So you just have to go and find it. Um, but if you, if you create this artificial scenario where we actually, let's see how much, let, let's scan. Let's, let's, let's try through putting the throughput of more and more beer by sending these guys with trays, these guys, in faster and faster to see how much beer we can deliver to a crowd in one go. Um, this is what the CHP plot looks like. So what I've got in the top right is a ramp of throughput. I'm just testing out all the possible throughputs I could have in terms of delivering beer into a crowd. And what I have along the bottom is the response time versus headroom. Well, the big space here is a distribution of response time versus headroom. right? And it's a scatter plot. But in this case, I've got a very controlled input and I get a straight line. And this is a well-behaved system, but it seems like whoever is putting beer on these trays, there's a bit of a bottleneck there, and it, we run out of capacity for the purposes of putting beer on these trays. So it gets slower and slower. You know, it takes longer and longer to respond as you put more people in. And these funny blocks on the side are histograms of the distribution. So I've got a very even distribution of throughput because I was kind of just doing this sort of test theoretically. And I have a, a distribution of response time that shows most of the time it's nice and fast, but it gets, you know, there's a smaller and smaller amount. Now that's not very realistic. So let's say, you know, let's say we were measuring a real system and it would look something like this. It's roughly the same. So I've got a roughly constant um, uh, distribution of throughput, and I have a sort of a, a distribution of response time that's a bit more varied, but it's still got this sort of up and to the right hockey stick curve kind of thing. So as, and this is what you expect. As you put more throughput into a system, its response time slows down. That's the bottleneck, right? So that's the computer version of the bottleneck, right? And you can see I've got a, this is sort of three days worth of fairly noisy looking data. The top right part of this graph is the throughput over time, just to give you some context for what this looks like. OK, so we figured out what a normal looking response time looks like if you happen to be delivering large amounts of beer into a large group of conference attendees. But what happens if, instead of this being go to Oahu, it's go to Hawaii? Let's say we're in Hawaii. And instead of beer, we're trying to deliver Mai Tais to people. And Mai Tais are much more complicated. <laughs> they have umbrellas in them. 
Um, and, and let's say there's only one person that knows how to put the umbrella in, and, and, and that causes another different kind of bottleneck. So we've got actually, um, we end up with a distribution that looks like this, and this is what happens when there's lock contention in the system because there's a serialization point where only one person can figure out how to get that umbrella. And there's lots of people that can make Mai Tais, and lots of people trying to drink Mai Tais, but there's only one person who's got the stock and can get that umbrella in exactly right. So if you ever see that distribution and it's got sort of, it's flat, but it's, it's going up. So here, if I double the throughput, I double the response time. You know, I'm just basically blocking up on one thing. So that's, that's a, a very different shape of graph. So, well, let's so help solve this problem by bringing in the same guys we had in London uh, and have them deliver lots of beer to people, but, and, and that lets us do simple drinks and complicated drinks. And if you're, if you're in Hawaii, you can get this really complicated drink, which is an entire pineapple. <laughs> it takes quite a long time to make. You start with a pineapple, you hollow out the pineapple, you put rum and stuff in it, and then you decorate it to look like a Dalek when you've drunk half of it. <laughs> It's got sort of, instead of saying exterminate, it says inebriate, inebriate, right? It's sort of, that's the general principle here. Um, so what we now have is a mixture of work going on. We're trying to, we have one group of, we have one guy delivering extremely high, uh, extremely high volume, very simple things, and you know, bottles of beer very easily, and we have some other people making these incredibly complicated drinks. And if we do them both at the same time, we get this very strange looking distribution um, if we plot it using our special beer you know, dr drink delivery monitoring service that we're still running, obviously, because it's in the cloud and it can see what's happening somehow. Um, and what's going on here is that, let's say we have a number of servers and they can either be filling trays with beer or they can be carving out um, uh, pineapples. So the f they start off like of the mixture of these things, but eventually they all end up carving pineapples because it takes forever and there's nobody filling trays with beer. And what happens then is the throughput goes down and it goes really, really slow and you're up on the top left side here. You're right up there. And, and eventually somebody finishes carving pineapples and there's a big stack of guys standing there with empty trays. So you start filling trays and the system starts delivering lots and lots of trays of beer and then gradually more orders for pineapples come in and you oscillate back. So this system is not stable. It oscillates back and forth between delivering lots and lots of very fast things and a few very slow things. And this is a, a characteristic which is quite hard to observe, but when you do these, tra these uh, distribution plots, it's easy to see that this is happening. And when you see a system oscillating, it's quite often because you've got a mixture of very slow things and very fast things that you're giving it to do at once. And th this, is, this is the characteristic of a thread-starved system. Right? There's plenty of spare capacity in the system, but you don't have enough threads. You need to add more people that can carve pineapples until you have an excess of people and you have some spare people left over that can also <laughs> deliver beer while the full possible number of pineapple carving is going on at the same time. So the way you solve this problem is by adding threads. Right? So now we can see, we know when we have lock contention, and if we have, we have out of threads, and we have normal behavior. Um, but I want to show you something else that happens, which is that if you manage to build systems that auto scale, that grow and shrink with capacity, which is sort of, you know, this was a good example, I think, you know, I have a scalable set of beers here that are being delivered. I'm getting multiple beers. Um, but the only example I could find was actually a Netflix one. This is actually one of our internal services that auto scales. And uh, AppDynamics has a, a way of plotting this. So it, this is the throughput, and this is the response time. The response time looks a bit weird, but one of the things you can see is that the lowest response time occurs when the throughput is dropping, and then it goes up a little bit later. Now, if you do the distribution plot for this, there's this weird sort of set of dots here. But what's actually happening is, let's start at the peak, peak throughput, okay, the top of that blue section. That's the bit to the furthest to the right. When, over time, what happens now is there's a circ you're, you're going around a circle. So you go down the bottom, along the bottom, lowest response time to the lowest throughput. And then what actually happens is, do I have a, can I just, yeah, there we go. Um, I now have very few machines or very few bottles of beer or whatever in front of me. And so as capacity increases, it actually goes up in a sawtooth because it gets a bit slow and then I add more machines and it drops. And so there's this sawtooth going up here as I'm throwing more capacity as I'm increasing. 
and then it comes all the way up here, and then, and then I'm throwing capacity away, and it sort of comes back down here. So you get a big loop in your, in your thing. So if you see a loop, you know you've got something that's sort of auto-scaling. All right, and uh, so that you can use this little CHP code that, that I wrote years ago to do the diagrams, or, or if you happen to have AppDynamics, I managed to persuade them to add this to their product, which made me happy. All right, so this is basically my summary plot. Um, these are the hard things, figuring out whether you have lock contention, whether you have a well-behaved system, whether you're oscillating and have thread shortages, or whether you have some sort of looping auto-scaled system. And if all you have to do is draw a graph, look at it, and decide which kind of, you know, what shape the graph is, and you can see what's going on. All right, so that's it. And we can finish with some liquid aloha. And <laughs> that was a nice deal. Do you also observe that um, when uh, uh, the system uh, uh, changes performance characteristic, then that the system itself is used in another way? So then your data also changes because, for you, of course, the users, for example, go away, and then you have auto scaling because. Um. <laughs> Yeah, you can certainly move between these different things. You could have a system that starts off well-behaved, and you put an all of a sudden, say maybe it's well-behaved in test, but when you go to production, there's more latency because real customers are further away, and all of a sudden you're out of threads, and system that starts off well-behaved starts becoming oscillating. So you, and you sometimes see this. Um, there's these graphs which show sort of throughput like this, except the, t the high point. See, this is a beautifully smooth top, right? But if the top looks like Dilbert's head, it goes up and then it oscillates like this, and then it's got a nice smooth dip, right? You know Dilbert's haircut? It's kind of so spiky on top. That's oscillating, and then at low load, it's actually nice and smooth. And sometimes you see throughput graphs that do that. And that spikiness means that at peak, you're out of threads, but at low, low, low utilization, it's being well behaved. So you're actually moving between these two positions on the left. And, and when you average everything out, you can't see those oscillations. It's one of the problems. It, and, and it's odd to think that a system would have an oscillating behavior. It's, a, it's not normally something you see. So it, but it's very confusing, because the first time I saw this graph at the bottom, I, th I couldn't figure out. It's not supposed to be that shape. <laughs> it's supposed to go up and to the right. But it's, yeah.